Good morning, everybody. This is episode 10 of the Off Topical Podcast. My name is Gardner. And I'm Raven. And is Qualcomm hindering the forward march of technological progress? A district court in California thinks so. Plus, there have been some big Linux releases this week. And we sit down with Zappa, developer of Ebony Spire Heresy, a retro dungeon crawler developed on Linux for Linux users. But first, before we get to the good stuff, I want to talk about uh, the story we covered last week, System76's new desktop that they manufacture here in the U.S. Well, we mispronounced the name. It's not Thelio. I reached out to Kate Hazen uh, from System76, and here's what she had to say about where the name came from and how it's pronounced. And this is quoting her. So Thelio is a combination of Greek origins, specifically Telos and Helio with references to I-O being implied at the end of it as well. It's pronounced similar to telos, which emphasis on the first syllable, telio. If you're going to shift vowels, it sometimes sounds like telio, but it's definitely not thelio. Just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to thank Kate for her insight on this topic. And now let's get to the good stuff. So the Luchas Game Manager had a had a new update. Did you hear about this, Raven? I did. Yeah, this is pretty exciting stuff. Um, and just so you guys know, Lutris supports my channel on Patreon. Uh, so I just wanted to have like total transparency there. Um, but the new version of Lutris adds a few features. Uh, what are they, man? Uh, Lutris now detects Proton and will integrate Proton apps into your Lutris library. That's actually really kind of nice actually yeah it lists proton as uh you know in along with the wine uh prefixes that you have pretty convenient actually i've I've thought about you know i actually don't use uh lutris i've thought but i have thought about using it i still use like you know i I set up wine staging and dxvk and everything myself yeah but i should probably consider start using it at at the very least for you know its scripts uh let's see what else does it have uh Warnings are now generated if DXVK versions are not found. Improved support for Xbox DRV configurations. That's really nice. Yeah. Better support for Feral's game mode. I didn't even know they didn't support that. Yeah, it, uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. I mean, um, one of the things that, like you said, you haven't used it. I, I don't use it a lot because, like, before Proton came out, I wasn't really, um, uh, I didn't really care about wine gaming that much, you know, and, and, you know, but what Lutris does is it takes care of a lot of the, the pain in the next uh, wine stuff. You know, like configurations and prefixes and such. And uh, I have used it before, and it does take care of a lot of that. But you know, like I said, uh, but the cool thing is too is this is an open source project. It's made available on, uh, um, on their website, and they actually have uh, they actually have repositories for most of the popular uh, Linux distributions, which is really cool. Yeah, I don't really use the whole, like, I don't actually really need to use, like, DXVK, for example, mostly just because my wine is mostly meant for, uh, you know, the good old games type stuff, like roller, well, actually, no, I, I play OpenRCT now, so I don't, but I used to use it for, like, Roller Coaster Tycoon and, um, you know, impression games, you know, like Caesar and all of that. That's what I used to use it for. And, you know, you really aren't going to get any advantage using Lutris for those old games because you know half of them have software renders anyway yeah i am um, i'm looking forward to some of the uh, features that they've promised if you look at their github um in their readme they have several uh features that they've promised planned features they have gog and humble bundle integration uh in the in the in the works and uh that's going to be really cool because um i'm not a big fan of uh the 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 what is that one l g o g downloader or whatever it is i i just find that that's like uh it, it requires a little too much you know setting up the house of cards you know <laughs> you know what i'm saying um i really i really like having like a, a a nice clean gui so so the fact that like g o g and humble bundle support is coming that's really exciting to me um, i i didn't even know there was such a thing called l g o g i didn't even know it existed oh oh yeah that's that's interesting i mean because you know my gog library is mostly filled with actually old games 
Yeah. I don't really go there to buy new games. Honestly, if I'm going to buy a new game, I'm not going to buy it at GOG. I'm going to buy it on Steam because that's just the way I am. Yeah. See, I like buying games not on Steam. <laughs> yeah, but some games, like, you know, I like my multiplayer to still work. You know, like Dying Light, you can get that on GOG, but the multiplayer doesn't work. It might work on... Actually, I don't even know if Dying Light has Linux support on GOG. Yeah, I don't know. But the thing is, though, mm. like, when it comes to owning my games, I feel like I own a game when I own it on GOG or on Humble Bundle, and when I buy it on Steam, I don't feel like I own it because I can't really do much with the actual binaries. I can't, you know, remove it from the Steam apps folder and use it elsewhere. Like, a lot of the time, those games require Steam to be open and running. And I, I'm not a huge fan of that. Yeah. No, I I understand that, absolutely. I'm just not as bothered by it. <laughs> yeah. Valve's, <laughs> Valve's, Valve's, Valve's not going anywhere, for better or worse. Well, you can say that, but, I mean, nobody thought the Titanic would sink either. <laughs> yeah, that's true, but I don't see the game industry suddenly going up and just disappearing. It's mm. long as, the, as long as the game industry doesn't disappear. I don't think Valve's going to go anywhere. But they might. And, you know, when that day comes, we'll have to approach it. I'll just go to my DOS machine and just, you know, laugh at, laugh at all of you. I'll just <laughs> enjoy my DOS machine because everything on there is on a floppy or a CD. Right. I like to own a copy, like a physical copy of my games, you know. That's why I was really sad when, uh, when uh, um, IndieBox closed their doors. You know, they stopped doing the IndieBox. I always, I always wanted an IndieBox. And then I was going to go and get one one time. And it was like literally right when they announced that they were closing. And I was like, well, I guess I'm not getting an indie box then. Yeah. I have several indie boxes, including Hollow Knight, um, Towerfall Ascension, and a few others. And they were great. Axiom Verge, too. Mm. Oh, love that game. Yeah. Um, in, my, uh, in my next cloud, I actually have a folder called Games. And it's every game that I owned for Humble Bundle, or on Humble and on GOG. It's 136.9 gigabytes, and those are mostly compressed installers. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that's, that's nerd cred right there. Um, all right. I feel like we covered that story pretty well. What do you guys think? Uh, are you a big fan of Lutris? Uh, what do you use it for? Do you use it for mostly wine gaming, or do you use it for managing all your libraries, including Steam? Let us know in the comments if you're watching this on YouTube or hit us up. Uh, you can email us at show at offtopical.net. I changed it because people don't know how to spell my name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your name is really hard to spell, dude. I mean, Sarcasm, some people, by the way. well, some people spell it G A R D N E R. Some people leave out the I. Some people spell it like a gardener, right? So I just figured show at offtopical.net. Uh, you know what? That's a good point. So we have a, a, a cool story a new release from Epic Games. Unreal Engine 4.21 is released. They have a bunch of new Linux features. This is pretty cool stuff. You sent me this story, Raven. I did. I did. I'm really glad I saw it because I literally sent it to you like right before we started to do the podcast. Yeah. And I was like, oh, gosh, I need to send this. Uh, so basically, uh, for all those of you out there who are hoping that, you know, developers who make their game in Unreal Engine 4 will stop using that trashy OpenGL 4 renderer that just yep. completely and utterly sucks. Yeah. On Linux, the new default backend is now Vulkan. Hooray! And has... All of the features that the direct well, I believe it has all of the features or for at least DirectX 11 and probably also for DirectX 12, which is uh, even if it doesn't, it, it, it runs better. In my experience using Vulkan with Unreal Engine 4, it works so much better than that weird, trashy OpenGL 4 render that they wrote. Yeah, I, I yeah, it Ugh. open OpenGL is is great, but Vulkan is is light years better, in my opinion. Now I'm hoping that Arc, for example, will backport the features. Arc? Yeah, Arc Survival of All. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I the game wanted... that barely freaking works. Yeah, that game. <laughs> I mean, it's all graphical issues. The rest yeah. of the game works fine because you know it's it's you know it's just it, it actually works fine. No, no, it is it is all the graphical issues related to that game. Uh, 
So, mm-hmm. and, and there was actually talks about that, by the way, that they were going to uh, backport Vulcan like a year ago. Yeah. And they were still looking into it. So I'm hoping that since it's the default, they'll do it because it'll fix so many issues. Uh, some other new features is the media player now supports uh, WebM containers using the uh, VP8 or 9 codec, which is awesome because now you can actually, I don't, I think all you had before was uh, MP4 using H.264. Right, yeah. And, I haven't and, used the media player. You know, it's it's good to have a variety because some people don't like using those types of um, encoders. <laughs> yeah, yes. Yeah, wonder who those people are. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the crash report GUI is finally implemented on GUI, so people finally. can submit crash reports. I know it's been five years. No, four years. Four years since they've no. Has it been four or five years? It has been four years since they've released Unreal Engine 4. Wow. That's, I, that's insane. Quite a, it doesn't feel that long. I, th- I remember like it came out when I first started the channel. And I was like, this is cool stuff. And I was following the development for a while. I was really excited about it. Never really talked about it on the channel early on, though. But yeah, it, it's, it's good stuff. Yeah. And we finally have that. Now we just need the, the launcher. One step at a time, everyone. One step at a time. I don't know why we have to wait so long. Right. Uh, the new Linux tool chain uh, has upgraded to Clang 12, which is, you know, that's pretty cool. Um, and also um, a new feature. I don't know if you uh, if you were able to read all of it because, you know, their, their release notes are pretty gigantic. Yeah. I, I mean, didn't get huge. to read the whole thing, but I, I did. I, I read the highlights. Uh, so did you see the pixel streaming feature that they have now? No, I didn't. <sighs> explain it to me, Grandmaster. Oh, I will explain it for you. So basically, they have built their own form of cloud streaming. Mm. I know, right? So I'm just going to read this straight from the page. Run a packaged Unreal Engine application on a desktop PC in the cloud and stream the viewport directly to any modern web browser on any platform. Get the highest quality rendering and lightweight apps, even on mobile devices, with zero download, zero install. So, Ugh. that's pretty interesting. Honestly, that is pretty interesting, but there's there's more, obviously. And uh, if you if you find it on the, uh, the page, it's a uh, McLaren. They have a picture of it. Uh, so how then it goes on to say you can broadcast a single game session to multiple viewers by simply sharing a link or send each connecting user to their own separate game session. The web page that hosts the engine viewport automatically sends keyboard, mouse and touch events back to the engine. You can customize the page with your own HTML5 UIs using custom JavaScript events to trigger and respond to gameplay events over the wire. Mm, interesting. I don't know if this supports Linux or not. I really don't, uh, but the requirements for it, you need Node.js, so it might work on Linux. Maybe. I don't know, mm. but I did want to mention it because that is a... Re- I, I don't fully understand what it's for, but they're definitely trying to captivate on the cloud market by just saying, hey, look, our engine out of the box. All right. Hold on a second. Uh, this is... I don't know. Like the it's idea, interesting, right? the idea of being able to, like, trigger custom JavaScript events, like remotely, when like <laughs> in in the client browser, that's actually pretty interesting. I'm I'm thinking of like the stuff that you could do with that. Yeah, you can do some really uh, crazy stuff. Have you yeah. um, hmm. have you seen Microsoft streaming platform? I don't even know. If, do you know that they have one? know that exists i forget what it's called but this cloud streaming stuff is baloney and a half it's really i don't like it just i'm just gonna lay that out there i think it's called mixer oh see i thought you were talking about like a cloud like a cloud gaming stream no sorry so um right so mixer is like twitch tv but microsoft and some games it has support for where like you can add like features to the game and then actually like it goes like it'll go in the game or like it'll affect the game like they have some really neat stuff like minecraft is supported for example 
Sam. like natively in the game itself it's supported to stream yeah it's 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 like like basically people can like vote on stuff huh and and certain games are supported not all games are supported but it's very cool uh i mean i'll never use the service i hear it's a little better than uh twitch really and probably youtube but that could just be because it's smaller it has a better community feel See, I've heard of Mixer, but I didn't know that Microsoft acquired them. That's fascinating. I think they've always been Microsoft. No, I, I looked at their page. I looked at their uh, about page. Yeah, that's right, because they used to be called Beam. Because that's why I couldn't remember the name. Because I was like, it starts with a B, and I couldn't find anything. Yeah, in 2016, Microsoft acquired Beam, and then they renamed it in 2017 to Mixer. Interesting. That's I had heard of Mixer, but I didn't know anything about it. But yeah, that's that's fascinating. Now I don't know if they still have that, but they did at one time. Yeah, because that's why I was interested. In it. I was like, you know, it's really cool, like playing a game and like your your viewers can like vote or whatever, and then you know if stuff happens like in the game. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, see, the thing is, it's like you know, Twitch plays Pokemon and stuff. Like that's kind of what I feel like this might be like the the use case for this, right? Or or like when you when you look at the actual um the release notes here there's actually an image of mclaren right and the the car company and they have the mclaren uh 570s and it's a configurator and so like the the game the game quote unquote the 3d rendering of the mclaren vehicle is you know embedded in the page and the rest of the website functions just normally and you just and you go ahead and, and create your you you customize your vehicle right and that's like an interesting use case but the thing is it's like think about the processing power that this actually requires on the server oh yeah side. It's, it's not like it's webgl it's, it's right. just sending video data so yeah you you need one heck of a hefty little machine there depending on the game oh, yeah. uh, but yeah. but it's out of the box so you know, Unreal, Epic, rather, sorry, Epic is just positioning themselves, I think. They're ready for cloud. And why not? It's not like they have the budget for it and the staff. If it never yeah. if it never bears fruit, at least they were ready if it did. I, I just see this, like, being, I mean, it's a cool idea, but the problem with, like, this, the cloud gaming stuff is that it will only ever take off with, like, Google or amazon or some big tech company backing it because like the the amount of like processing that has to go into you actually computing like all the games graphic i feel like that's not uh sustainable for a smaller or uh, you know a smaller company to to manage like i just see i just don't see it as being viable for like a company like mclaren to be having a configurator like this that like has really nice graphics being streamed to the end user like i don't know yeah i think i think it would serve better for them to like build like a webgl demo and because it'd be less data to send overall right so and you know then you just stream in whatever the player needs yeah. not all of it at once because you know if you're streaming like 4k video even if it's kind of crappy 4k video yeah that's still a lot of data a lot of bandwidth and you're crunching a lot of information all at once and you know if you have like 15 or 20 people on your website at one time all of them streaming a 4k source from your server i mean that's just insane amount of compute and and bandwidth it i mean i just feel like it's not sustainable like cloud cloud gaming i just don't see it uh well you know there's probably all kinds of ways you can optimize so like you're really only doing it once so to speak and you know everybody gets their own little instance but you know it's still the same program mm. and it's just all being rendered there's probably lots of ways you can optimize it um playstation for example has playstation now i don't know if you've ever used it before i no. tried it it actually works pretty good really you basically get like the entire playstation 3 catalog as well hmm. i don't know it's it's not for me though no, I mean, the thing is, it's like, if you're going to play... Latency. Yeah, the latency is huge. And, and on a controller, granted, at 10 feet away from your screen, like, with a controller, it lag isn't that big of a deal, to be fair. But, like, if you're a PC gamer with a mouse and keyboard, 
or even a PC gamer with a controller, that lag is 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 an insurmountable challenge for these companies to overcome because PC gamers expect more than that, you know? Yeah. They invest a lot of money into their hardware to not have to experience lag to have the best, like most buttery smooth performance they can get. I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, you you figure, you know, multiplayer, most most of the most popular games are on multiplayer. Yeah. So, you know, you figure like let's say you say you luck out and you have, you know, fifty MS to just the, the cloud server. Yeah. And that would actually be pretty good because I don't think I've ever connected to a cloud platform and had a you know, a fifty millisecond latency. But then you figure, you know, you're going to connect somewhere else. Like, let's say, you know, I connect to one in Arlington, Virginia, yeah, which is the closest big giant node on the East Coast. And then, you know, I connect to like a server that's in like, say, New York. Well, now all of a sudden, even though like I'm connected to the multiplayer server and, you know, my, you know, my latency f- from the game, which is in the cloud to the server, I don't know, let's just say it's like, 80 or something doesn't really matter you know so you have that plus you also have the time it takes to get to me and then of course you know there's the whole reaction time because it's not like it's just you know 130 millisecond latency it's like the server sends to the client and then the client has to actually send it to me so i can react so i just don't see it i've never really seen it work well honestly uh because you just you end up not being able to react fast enough because you end up losing about a second or two of time uh, and then some uh, streaming services that I have tried, they only allow multiplayer within their cloud bubble. Right. And, you know, that terrifies me because I'm like, oh, great. We're going to end up with like 10 different streaming companies and like one friend's going to buy it on this company. And then the other group of friends are going to buy it over here. And then that one dude can't play with everyone else because, you yeah. know, he got a better deal for this one. And it's like, oh, yeah, I don't like it. I don't like the also I don't like the idea that like, you know, you talk about Steam, you know, not owning a game, but in a way with Steam, you still kind of own it with cloud. You don't own anything. You're just connecting to a platform and getting a video. Right. Yeah, I, I, I like I'm fundamentally like opposed to the idea of paying money for nothing. I don't have a Netflix account. I don't have a Hulu account. I don't have a, a CBS All Access account. Right. Because it's like paying 10 bucks for literally nothing. You get nothing out of it after you've watched your show and the month is over, you know, I, and, and it's the same thing with with cloud gaming. I'm like if they ever come out with the Netflix, quote unquote, the Netflix of of gaming, I won't do it. I am opposed to that kind of stuff. But anyway, I don't yep. know. Dude, how many times are we going to argue about cloud gaming on <laughs> at the show forever because people keep yeah. people people keep wanting it to be a thing so forever it's the bad idea that won't die yep god damn you know it. i remember when on live first came out and i had yeah. access to it i couldn't even i couldn't even use it at the time because it just didn't work really i i got to play like i don't even remember what game it was but i got to play like one game like one time and i remember like turning my mouse and then like paul's and then it would turn. And I was just like, oh, this is awful. Yeah. I don't know. Cloud gaming. It'll 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 happen someday. You know, Microsoft was really hoping for cloud gaming with the Xbox One. Yeah, I know. And and that like because I think what they advertise like the Titanfall does a whole bunch of like which it doesn't, by the way. But oh, yeah. they advertised that Titanfall one did a whole bunch of stuff on the cloud and then sent it to the player. Right. And it's like sure. And Electronic Arts said the same thing with uh, the the latest Sim City. Oh, I remember that. Yeah. And then someone hacked it, so it didn't do that, and it functions just fine. Yeah. It's just it's, an excuse, man. Just oh, an dude, excuse. It's all baloney, man. It's all like anytime I hear someone say cloud anything, I'm like, my eyes roll back in in the back of my head, and I I'm, I have like a, a minor seizure because I'm like next cloud. No, well, Nextcloud is different because it's <laughs> that's different. <laughs> you got me there, man. You got me. I did. I did. Uh, no, uh, you know what I mean, though, right? <laughs> like cloud cloud computing is just baloney. Go on, dig the hole, dig it. 
yeah, whatever. You know what I'm saying? I just, I don't, I don't know. I don't buy it. Nextcloud is cool because I own my hardware and I run it on my hardware. Absolutely. I don't trust anybody else's cloud. I, the I don't cloud either. is literally just corporate speak for somebody else's computer and I don't buy it. All right. I think we've ranted enough about that. <laughs> Me too. Actually, I was going to say, I was going to say uh, how much of this, of uh, this news is them prepping to bring Fortnite to Linux. Oh, you know, you know, the crash report coming to Linux is actually a pretty big deal. Yeah. Because up until now, if you wanted to get, you know, well, you couldn't get it. Right. Users would have to send you like a log file, which, I mean, come on, really? Like what, what, what day and age are we in? Really? Yeah. And also too, you know, just cause someone's on Linux doesn't, you know, Linux has a lot of new people on it who don't know anything about computers. Right. Which is great. But that also means asking for a log file is like asking for, like, you know, the moon. Right. So, you know, it's nice that they finally have it. And, yeah, I think it's one step closer. Because if the launcher comes to Linux, then the last big hurdle for Fortnite coming to Linux is gone. Because that is one of the biggest holdups for them. The, I, would, I would argue the next big holdup for Fortnite would be whatever anti-cheat service they use. Right. Would, because outside of that, everything that Fortnite is is custom made by Unreal. So, I'd be surprised. Do they actually use a third party like middleware for anti cheat? I I don't know uh, because they've been pushing a lot of anti cheat stuff built in Unreal. So I think they have their own. But I I you know I I don't play Fortnite, so I have no idea. All right, all right. What do you guys think? Do you think Fortnite is going to come to Linux? Uh, let us know if 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 it does i'll be the first linux user to be streaming fortnite on twitch i'm on twitch twitch.tv slash zondak i stream there uh at least twice a week fridays or saturdays and sundays check it out uh twitch.tv slash zondak So Microsoft is porting sys internal apps to Linux. This is quite fascinating stuff. I I know, right? I was very surprised. I'm I'm more surprised that it's MIT licensed actually. Right? <laughs> like I think that's the part that's actually surprising to me right there. When I first wrote the headline for this in the in the in the doc, uh, which you can check out if you want to read the show notes, uh, patreoncom slash Gamer. Um, I originally wrote Microsoft to port sys internal apps to Linux, are, but will they be open source? Question mark. But uh, then I actually went and found the GitHub repos for these, and yeah, they're MIT licensed. That's pretty cool. Right now, you can get Proc Dump, and it's on their GitHub. Uh, and and the the readme on their GitHub page says, uh, Proc Dump is a Linux reimagining of the classic proc dump tool from the sys internal suite of tools for windows proc dump provides a convenient way for linux developers to create core dumps of their application based on performance triggers they're also working on bringing proc man um, and this is big news especially for windows developers and sysadmins who are new to linux and are used to using these tools yeah i mean it's it's fantastic that they're bringing it i'm actually surprised they're doing it uh, me Honestly. too. Yeah. Like I'm I'm absolutely astonished that they're doing it, but I think it's also times are changing. Yeah. And you just you can't win against the behemoth that is Linux. So oh, no. it's either join or die. Right. Well, I mean, so there's two things that go through my mind with this, right? It's like the fact that so like Sys internals is like like legendary on on Windows, right? Like it's legendary. People on uh, system administrators Sys internals is like a uh, a necessary tool for a lot of them. The fact that the fact that like uh, fifty percent of Azure instances are running in Linux, I mean that that tells you something. I, I think that this came from the fact that like um, Azure employees uh, who are who have to like debug Azure instances were really uh, irritated by the fact that the tools that they use on Windows aren't available on Linux. And so they decided to port this over. Like, this has to be like an ease of, you know, like a pain point for them that they're solving, I think. Um, 
Oh, probably. Yeah, and the and but I also see this. This is the kind of thing that like actually m- m- kind of makes me think Microsoft has had a change of heart. You know, because this is like their um now I don't know if like the original releases of these tools are are open source. I'm pretty sure I read that they were freeware. Um but yeah, I mean th- like with Microsoft releasing their tools uh as like MIT or or you know whatever open source license they want. I mean, that is the kind of stuff that like kind of makes me rethink my position on Microsoft. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's a good business move cuz yeah. you know, honestly, what keeps people tied to Windows? Their tools. Um and, you know, if people are going to leave anyway, you might as well tie them to your tools and yeah. then you can still make money from them and that doesn't matter what platform they're on. Right. So, you know, to me, it's a good business decision and we benefit kind of. So it's a win-win for everybody. And now granted, this is a reimagining of the classic Proctome, right? Because the architecture of Windows versus Linux is, is significantly different. I don't think that they could do like a straight port, you know? So. Oh, yeah. it's it's It just functions the same, but it's right. completely different. Yeah. On the, you know, source-wise. Because, you know, Linux is not Windows, obviously, thankfully. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank God. But yeah, this is this is cool. I'm I'm pretty excited about this. Um, I I want to know what you guys think. If this is uh, something that you're excited about, um, were these tools that you used on the Windows side of uh, your life, or are you uh, are you happy with the tools that you have? Um, let us know what you think. You can hit us up show at offtopical.net, or I'm on Twitter at the Linux Gamer, and Raven is Raven six seven eight five four on Twitter. So a U.S. court issues ruling stating that Qualcomm must license its technology to rival firms. Now, you sent this to me just before we, we started recording the show. Um, I know. Two great pieces of news appeared right before. <laughs> definitely. Um, what do you think about this? What's your initial thoughts? Honestly, I'm not surprised. You know, uh, all these big um, tech firms that make hardware, particularly that make hardware, like Samsung, um, Qualcomm, I can never say their name properly. It just, <laughs> it's like, okay, moving on. You know, uh, they're, they're honestly, they're dicks to each other and to have, by extension, everyone else. Yeah. So I'm not really surprised. They've had some really shady kind of just not great practices. What really, however, interested me about this ruling is that obviously Qualcomm opposed this ruling. I mean, <laughs> Of course they did. Right. You know, that's that's an under that's like that's that's obvious and even understanding because any business would oppose any court ruling telling them how to do their job. So, of course. But the FTC also opposed like they wanted to give them 30 days as a response. And that really surprised me because the judge ignored both of them and she was like, "No, nah, too bad." <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> it's like like okay then. Well, I mean, the, Qualcomm's been in hot water before. I mean, they were sued in Taiwan and uh, Korea, South Korea, I think. Uh, oh, they've been sued everywhere. Where they haven't, haven't they've been sued here <laughs> yeah. multiple times. Like, where haven't they been sued at this point? Right. I mean, they've they've been doing like quite a bit of uh, what what some might call anti competitive business practices. I mean, some they, it, man, I'm a capitalist, and even I claim that they use quite a bit of very nasty anti-competitive oh yeah business practices i mean it's it's just downright dirty uh, they they uh, they straight up abuse they're kind of the definition of abuse of the patent system i would say them and apple yeah and it's like um so basically th- what the story is is they have been charging uh or they've been accused of charging exorbitant royalties for their technologies that were quote essential to industry standards and uh, the ruling that came down from this California court says that uh, Qualcomm must license some of their patents involved with making their modem chips, which is what's uh, referenced in the in the uh, actual ruling. And these are chips that are used to connect to LTE and uh, to, uh, to other, uh, you know, mobile networks. And uh, this is interesting because, like you said, like the FTC was willing to uh, settle with Qualcomm out of court, it sounded like, or to at least respond to this. 
Um, but the judge, uh, Lucy Co, I'm hoping I'm saying that right, said, no, nah, these guys have to share, you know, you know, license their patents in a fair way. And um, I feel like like that is the kind of the way to deal with these unruly companies. You know, don't yeah. don't just settle with them because they don't they don't learn from their mistake that way. Oh, I know. They just pay the fine and then they just move on. Yeah. They have so that's much really money is. that it doesn't matter if you find them or what. You just have to tell them how to actually behave. Yep. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. Um, uh, you know, it's it's funny that specifically this mentions, uh, you know, their modem chips, which are used for LTE. Uh, did you know that they also make Wi-Fi cards for like computers, like laptops? Yeah. I've, I, did you know that they're one of the worst things I've ever had in a machine ever? Yeah. <laughs> they're pretty bad. Like industry standard, my ass. Well, I mean, they're, they're horrible. Every single one, every time I've ever had to help someone with a laptop that has Wi-Fi issues, it's always one of those disgusting crappy chipsets yeah dell had them for a while in their xps line and dell took them out because too many people were complaining of like the the wireless card just dropping so they just went back to intel wi-fi yeah which actually just works i actually like intel wi-fi it just works i like intel Wi. here's the thing like when i first like came over to linux like wi-fi was a an effing nightmare like it really that's was. like an understatement yeah. remember when you used to have to use like the wine wrapper to get the driver to work. Oh my God. Yeah. I remember that. Oh, <laughs> you remember those days. Oh, that was so they, there was even an automated tool for it, man. Like, <laughs> yeah. Oh, make making, making you feel old now, huh? Yeah. Oh my God. Well, so the thing is, it's like, uh, I'm glad that like a lot of Qualcomm chips aren't in PCs <laughs> because like they were some of the worst, like Broadcom, Qualcomm. Uh, what was the other one that was like a big pain in the ass? Atheros? Is that, does that sound right? Mm, I think so. Yeah. For I went through like six computers before I bought a System Seventy Six. I went through six, uh, like four, three or four laptops before I bought my System Seventy Six laptop, and each of them had some piece of crap proprietary Wi-Fi chip set that did not that wasn't supported on Linux, and it's it's just insane to me, like how linux became popular in that time when that was such a pain in the ass you know because you just did that stupid wine wrapper and just ran it that way and that was the only way to get it to work yeah. i mean broadcom got better uh i don't think Qualcomm ever got better no I, I i i think they've kind of gotten out of that market but they own the patents for it all right and i guess that's the problem i don't know if they own it for like wi-fi but i know they own a bunch for lte because they've been suing apple hard lately because they want a, some of apple's money yeah and apple so. sued them back for a billion dollars did you hear about that one yeah i did Ugh. good yeah i don't like either one i don't i don't like either of the companies but i like watching multi-billion dollar companies smack each other around <laughs> it's pretty funny but it also you know i uh, there are also frivolous lawsuits and i think those should be illegal too but oh know. frivolous lawsuits should be illegal but yeah anyway what do you think about this story? Uh, do you think that the that the the court did the right thing here, or do you think we should uh, just let these companies be and do what they are, whatever they want, or are you somewhere in between? I guess you know there's not only two extremes here. Let us know what you think. Um, you can hit us up on Twitter at the Linux Gamer or at Raven six seven eight five four, or in the show notes, uh, patreoncom slash Gamer. With us today, we have Zappa, uh, creator of Ebony Spire. Um, thanks for joining us, man. Hi. Thanks for the invitation, guys. It's great to be here. It's great to have you. Um, so we wanted to talk to you about your game and, uh, and maybe, you know, let people know what it's about. So could you give us a quick overview of your title? Yes, well, uh, my title is pretty much a combination between a few of the games that I was playing uh, growing up. Uh, it's a first-person turn-based dungeon crawlers where enemies throw everything at you, including the kitchen sink. <laughs> nice. Uh, <laughs> that's the main mechanic of the game. Like, you're just you have all the abilities the NPCs have. Uh, you got to climb a tower, and there are items everywhere. Items which can, can change the gameplay, can you know, cast spells, stuff like that. And if the enemies get to them before you, they're going to throw them at you, they're going to cost them at you, they're going to use them against you, and they're pretty much going to cause you a really, really, really bad time. 
Like my favorite instance from the game is when you're you're ready to actually get to the next floor and somebody throws a teleportation potion on you and you get thrown I teleported into the middle of uh, a lot of angry 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 priests. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I I've died a fair bit in your game. So <laughs> I, I would like to say I'm sorry, but honestly, I'm not. That's why I designed it for. <laughs> oh gosh, it's so brutal because uh, the first the first time I played it, um, I had no idea what I was doing because you know, screw your tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> what tutorial? Yeah, what? Yeah, well, you had the little, you know, the instruction page, right? Yeah. Did you know? And I opened it, and it was a wall of text. So naturally, of course, I hit back because I didn't want to read it. <laughs> so. <laughs> I, I was like, yeah, it's cool. I got this. I've played enough old school games. <clears throat> so I died within like maybe a minute or so, 30 seconds, something like that. So then I went back to the main menu and read your instruction screen there. And uh, and then I actually got really, really far. And I really enjoyed uh, Cursed Items when it first came out. I think I nerfed them a bit over time, right? Yeah, you nerfed them. You 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 took away my shiny items that I had that were actually like really nice. <laughs> yeah, there were a lot of people complaining <laughs> that the cursed items like they, they 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 just behave worse than normal items some way, and they, they don't stick to your character. You know, like in Adam or in our games. In my case, only like the cursed item. You're just unlucky enough to have the shitty versions, but I didn't want to say shitty on them. <laughs> Yeah, but some, like, when it came out, if I remember correctly, some of the cursed items had, like, some really insane stats with, like, very little negative impact. You are throwing them. You are throwing them. Yeah. So, uh, one thing in the game is all items have a weight factor. And you can imagine you can hit a monster way harder if you throw something that's extremely heavy at them versus something that's extremely light. And one of the penalties of the cursed item was... Uh, maybe they would have some great stat at some point, but their weight would mean that you would only get to carry one of those items in your inventory. So I'm pretty sure Raven just was running around the level just throwing uh, swords and armors at other monsters and then picking them up and throwing them again. <laughs> Look, it's a valley tactic. <laughs> it is. It's, it is. <laughs> that sounds like something Raven would do. <laughs> Can't blame a man. So I'm fascinated to hear about like why you decided to support Linux with your title. Um, like what were the and what were some of the challenges that you faced when you were bringing the game over? Well, here's the thing: is that it's not that I wanted to support Linux with a title. Actually, that I've been developing my games on Linux since 2010 exclusively. I think minus the ones that I'm doing for my clients. That's so awesome. So it wasn't it wasn't about porting it to Linux. It was like making it on Linux and then finding out that people who tired of distribution because I'm an Ubuntu guy since uh, 604. Yeah. Uh, and I tried a few other distributions, but that, that's my main one. So anyway, like the challenges were like actually uh, packaging it correctly for other people. Uh, for like, but that was pretty much it. You're talking for other distributions or for other yes. operating systems? No, no, for our distribution. Was porting, porting to Linux was to Linux. Porting to Windows was fun because uh, okay. <laughs> it figured just going to go a bit easier. Uh, but that wasn't the case. Uh, mostly, mostly because of uh, support for OpenGL 4.4 and some Windows versions that other people are using are using 4.3. You know, I didn't not expect that to be the case. Uh, but, Interesting. Yeah, uh, yeah so, it, was, it was like the other way around. <laughs> yeah. Certain Intel cards kind of popped up there and maybe uh, was that what was caused the uh, OpenGL difference? I, I really have no idea other than um, I was, I think I was better testing the game on Steam. Uh, because I didn't do early access, I just started selling it. And two days later, there were other people complaining that they cannot run the game on Windows. Apparently, Linux was fine, except, except for one person who had a library mismatch. Uh, but we were trying to debug it, and at one point, I went like, there's these uh, two like DirectX diagnostic, but it's for OpenGL. And the common case was everybody was on Windows 4.1 and uh, on uh, OpenGL 4.1. Uh, and the funny thing is, like, from what I understood, like, most of the when part of the Windows systems uh, who are not receiving upgrades <laughs> are using that base OpenGL version. So I, I had like a tough decision wow. <laughs> to make. That's yeah. crazy to me that, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. So, so the challenges really were that uh, you developed the game on Linux and then bringing it to other platforms was, was a pain in the ass. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Don't get me started on Mac because I'm releasing the one year anniversary update now and I do not own a Mac. However, I have a good friend who did the Mac port for me 
and he's been unavailable and not online for the past two months and I'm sweating here thinking like crap I gotta do another release and I'm not gonna feature Mac again and I know I have some Mac users who love the game and they're, they're calling me on me so I'm gonna probably apologize <laughs> in some way uh, that's all right Mac users are used to give, being given the shit end of the stick <laughs> It's it's not it's not my it's not like what I what I want to do like I right. really want to support the guys but I'm gonna find I'm gonna find a way to bring it to them, but you know it's like a, there are people on uh, the gaming Linux gaming magazine uh, saying that like, it actually feels great to see that we're getting the game first and not Mac users. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> that's kind of been the case uh, with a lot of games that I've seen coming out recently um, that the Linux users get it before Mac, which you know raises some. So ideas. Mac has some pretty. St- Pretty stiff requirements these days. Well, you only have OpenGL what four point one and OpenGL three point two or three point three yeah. core, yeah. and then of course you have Metal. That's all you got. Oh no, <laughs> I'm not touching Metal. Yeah, no way, no way. Yeah, but yeah, it's easier to just go for Linux first nowadays because you got to get all the free open source tools. You don't have to pay a subscription. You got to pay Apple a hundred dollars every year. You don't have to, you don't have to send a fax with your company information to apple to get approved and it's it's just less things you gotta handle in order to do a release there so you know this is why i'm pretty sure like Linux is winning right now so all right well that's really cool that you've been doing um your game development on linux for like oh it sounds like the last some some odd years eight years or something Mm -hmm. like that yeah yeah uh, have you found? I, I've heard some people say that like Linux uh, is missing a lot of like graphics debugging tools. Did you, have you found that to be the case? Uh, I don't know because most of my games like I'm they, 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 I'm using 2D graphics usually on uh, planes and cubes and stuff like that. Like I, I haven't gone full 3D since back in 2006 when I tried to make an MMORPG. <laughs> oh, nice! MMOs are an interesting challenge. It's and it's the first thing everybody wants to do when they're when they're starting game devving. So <laughs> you know, this does scare me so much for the graphics and their cost that I said like no. Uh, so to, to answer your question, yeah, I don't I don't think at least from my experience that Linux is lacking a lot of the tools. Like one thing that's lacking on Linux that I really love on Windows is uh, Paint.net, mm. which it's open source version. Paint doesn't work for me. Whenever I try it, like there's always some problems with it. But that's the only thing that I feel it's missing. I have uh, I use GIMP a lot. Have you tried GIMP at all? Yes, I, I am using GIMP. Uh, my biggest problem with GIMP, and I haven't went into customizing GIMP using scripts and stuff like that. It's that it's that doesn't show me like all the information I need on screen. That Paint.net does it extremely easy, and that is like the size of the selection, the corner you started, the corner you're ending at it, and stuff like that. Because I have like a workflow set up for doing pixel art extremely fast and that's based on paint.net when i was learning it in the beginning mm. and, and like i use gimp nowadays for cutting my sprites but it, I, i'm a bit slower with it uh, but then, then when i have to use it like i'm gonna use it i'm on all like my main traveling development station nowadays is a chromebook with linux support in it, on it and i'm using gimp on that one and it's fine it's great but it's just i'm not just that fast with it have you tried uh Krita as an alternative to GIMP? Yes, but that reminds me of Photoshop, and I still cry when I remember Photoshop CS2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it does have quite a, a Photoshop feel, but um, as far as drawing, I find it to be quite superior to GIMP. I'm just going to say that it's amazing when you're drawing on it with a tablet. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it really is. Yeah, I use I use Krita for when I'm doing uh, like draw tablet stuff, and I use GIMP for the rest. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think that that's I think that's what Krita is out there because it's amazing when you're when you're using a tablet, even the shitty ones. Yeah, I use uh, for pixel art. I use a sprite. Yes, I bought it. I've like I'm moving into it. However, uh, I found my own Nintendo 3DS, and you know they have pix amazing pixel art software on it. I did not. That's I'm my main pixel art. Uh, the, 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 thing that I use nowadays is the Nintendo 3DS whenever I'm commuting. Wow. It's amazing. And you, <laughs> you can save it to the SD card that import it and you can switch palettes on the fly and it's it's Jesus, it's incredible. That's really cool actually. I have two 3DSs and I never considered doing that. I I, did, I had no idea that they had any I've never owned a, a 3DS. The the last portable 
device that I have from Nintendo is uh, a Game Boy Advance. Well, I have a, a Switch, but you know, there's a big gap yeah. there that I just kind of <laughs> don't have. I had no idea they had drawing tools on. It. I mean, it doesn't surprise me. I mean, it has dual touch screens, but it was like it was fun. It's for pretty this. cool. You're using the upper screen as a mini map of your entire drawing, and you can work on the lower one, like zoomed in, and you can see how it's forming together. And they got layers, and it's amazing. I got to open it up and see exactly what the name is. But it has uh, the icon is that guy from the Crime Twins. Uh, it was a cartoon on Cartoon Network a long time ago. Uh, this is the easiest way to recognize it. It's a full-featured sprite editor. It just doesn't feature animation, but you can stack layers and you can switch through the layers really fast using the shoulder buttons. So it's you can't technically do animations on it. It's wow. analogical animations. <laughs> is that um? Is that homebrew? Is that is that like legit? Like through? No, it's official. You can get it from the Nintendo eShop. Wow. That's yeah, really four cool. ninety nine dollars, I think. That's awesome. Yeah, and they also have the basic interpreter, so you can write games in basic on the Nintendo DS. <laughs> That's really cool too. Mm-hmm. Kind of makes me want to get one because I'd love to try that. No, it'd it, probably be better to just homebrew development of a game on a three DS, but I haven't tried it yet. Like I did Nintendo DS homebrew for a while. Uh, never tried it on the three DS. I tried it on my original. Uh... 3ds that i got when when they first came out and uh it was it was really buggy and i haven't done it since <laughs> yeah that they, they kind of nailed this one so it's hard to homebrew on it i saw a lot of uh a lot of ways to get homebrew games on it nowadays with our cartridges there's a guy from i forgot his name right now he's got like a cartoon character for an avatar on twitter that's doing amazing homebrew stuff pretty sure he ported or maybe his own version of portal on the 3ds and it's actual portal wow that's awesome. That's a whole lot of assembly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm waiting for the guy to actually jump into proper game development and do his own games because he's amazing. Like I, I saw some of his DS prototypes that he had like four megabytes of RAM and he was able to pull some cool 3D graphics and effects on it. So when that guy actually decides to actually start making his own games, it's, it's going to blow dice out of the water. I'm pretty sure about it. Well, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> um so with your game ebony spire um mm-hmm. did you create the engine from scratch uh it's it's a big story like the first like it's technically the engine that i started in 2010 uh but over the years like i started playing will of 2d and i ported the syntax because uh, i've been using lua since i was working at game Off in 2010 uh, so I, I usually have a base code in Lua, which is the same one across all my engines since 2010, and it's just the backend that's differently implemented. In this case, right now I'm using Moai, which is an amazing cross-platform uh, game framework based on C and Lua. But that's my own framework for handling UIs, for logic, for sprites. Uh... Wow, that's... And it has it has it has some custom edits to the source code just so I can get it to run on my uh, weird monitor setup, uh, which apparently it turns out to be extremely bad for my customers because they are having problem with full screen on a single monitor setup. <laughs> so I got to remove that for this anniversary release. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's it, it's technically half my own engine and usually writing on the back of another C and Lua engine. Cool. Well, it looks great, and um, I haven't given it a try yet, but uh, it, it Raven can't stop raving about it. I think that's why he <laughs> is called Raven. Isn't that right? Oh, yeah, absolutely, man. I love it. <laughs> I'm a huge fan of Ebony Spire. Oh, yeah. thank you. Thank I'm, I'm going to pick it up on Steam. Or is there a better way that you can uh, support you? Like, are you on other uh, platforms? To... I'm also on H.io because I'm, I'm one of the biggest fans of H.io as a platform. I've been with them since the beginning. They're one of the first 10, I think, accounts that subscribe to them. And I know Amos from way back when he was running DevSofa, which was like a channel for game developers where they could talk and just share beta builds between each other. Uh, so you can get it there. I'm also setting up a... Because like, I'm having a lot of problems with Steam right now with the changes that they're doing. Uh, three weeks ago, they did a change in the games they were showing from related games. They were showing from other games pages and my traffic dropped from like a thousand to thousand visits per week without any updates to really zero. So I decided I'm just gonna try and set up my own uh, payment framework on my website. Because if I have to bring my own traffic to Steam nowadays, I might as well just bring it to my own website. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, there's something to be said about 
self-hosting rather than using someone else's platform. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love Steam, don't get me wrong. Like, I, I love it. Like, it handles a lot of stuff for me, and it, it made the game known to a lot of people, uh, which I'm extremely thankful for. But, it, like, the way it's going right now, I'm gonna, still going to keep on using it, but I'm going to try and put all my efforts, most of them, to actually go towards my my web page and there I can actually offer things that Steam doesn't allow me. For example, separate uh, binaries built on separate distributions and a better way to do troubleshooting for people and FTP access if they want it and stuff like that. Nice. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll let everybody out there know when you have that set up. Um, but right now, you think Itch is the best way to, to support your uh, your work here? Well, itch is the best way to support my work and support itch.io because I, I I don't have the slider set up to zero percentage to go to itch. I actually want to support them as much as possible. So yeah, it does say itch is the best way. Uh, however, like the game's probably going to go live on Steam first and then itch a few hours later because it's like going for Steam. It's like a whole lot of scripts and a whole lot of things to set up. Yeah, I've had I have a little bit of experience getting Steam games to like publishing steam games I and mean, it's kind of an ordeal <laughs> it, it's fine when you're publishing from linux because hey the nothing beats the turtle uh, but yeah. i'm gonna have to publish this one from my windows development station at this point because uh, this is like i i, I had to head set up tortoise svn uh for the anniversary update because i was having a lot of problems with git for some reason with my router so I, I got all the source on Windows right now, and I'm going to do a publish straight from there, and then I'm just going to move to my Chrome OS laptop and publish to HBO and the rest of them. And maybe do a Chrome OS port, <laughs> an Android version. Uh, so yeah, they're, they're, like, the people are going to know when the game goes up, because I'm going to be screaming my lungs off on Twitter. They're, they're, this update isn't usually for new people. It's for the older people who actually got me through a rough time with uh, their support on the game. And this is something this something goes up for them. And since ninety percent of them are on Steam, well, uh, I'm gonna focus on getting it to them first, and then just go to itch.io and go, "Hey guys, this is yours." Like I'm gonna send an email to every each purchaser. Nice. Um, I uh, I'm about to purchase the game right now on itch.io. You guys out there listening are uh, more than encouraged to buy the game as well. Um, this is a uh, it's been a lot of fun having you on the show, man. Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> It's been a blast. Thanks for coming. Oh, thanks for thanks for inviting me. Like, when Raven told me, I was like, "Yeah, I'm excited. I, I want to join." What what do I have to do? <laughs> hey, absolutely. Well, yeah, we're glad to have you. Anytime you have a game coming out, let us know, and we'll we'll have you on the show. Yes, I will do so. All right, Raven. You think we got time for some listener comments? Oh, you know we do. My favorite section, man. Absolutely. Uh, so here we go. Uh, Sick Mind on YouTube. Sick Mind 33 asks, number one, do you think Adobe would make a Linux port if the demand was there and would it be good? I think that the demand is there. Um, I don't know if Adobe would do that. Uh, I think that they're more likely to like do like a cloud streaming service um, because they're just terrible. <laughs> what do you think, man? Uh, don't they already do that for Chrome OS? Oh, yeah. Do they? I don't know. I, I don't follow Adobe because I just don't like them. I thought they did. Isn't there like a Photoshop for... Oh, Photoshop Express. Mm. That's what it is. Yeah, you can use it on Chrome OS. It's free too, apparently. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> I don't know how good it is. Um, hmm. So the question is, do I think that they would make a Linux port if demand was there? And would it be good? Uh, no, the port would not be good. And I'll tell you why. Because Photoshop is a buggy piece of mess on any platform you use it on. And uh, yeah. let the hate flow towards me from everyone that's, you know, oh, that dude. likes Photoshop. But it's it's fine. It's <laughs> They run like five separate background services when you launch it. So... No, I think it would be a nightmare on Linux. Yeah. Um, and the next thing is the demand. I don't know if the demand's strong enough for them willing to port it, but I definitely can see in the future that there being enough demand and it being viable. I could, I could definitely see that. Yeah. See, I think demand is, I think there's enough uh, people on Linux or people who want to move to Linux to sustain the cost 
of Adobe porting their tools to to Linux. But honestly, I think that we as a community should aim higher than Adobe. Because, oh, absolutely. Because there are some great, amazing tools on Linux. Um, we have Krita. We have GIMP. We have um, Caden Live, uh, Audacity, which definitely could use some improvement. But all of these tools are amazing in their own right. And, and I think that we as a community, as open source fans, as lovers of freedom, should, uh, should do things like put our money where our mouth is and actually like give money to these to these open source projects that that will would allow us to to use these tools as replacements for adobe products maybe i'm a, being a bit uh overly uh optimistic but i i really think that you know we could do better than adobe oh absolutely let's not also forget about natron oh natron that's right natron is cool yeah, everyone always forgets about Natron. I guess it's because... Nobody knows about... Like, very few people I know actually know about Natron. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Because Natron's actually a really... I guess it's an alternative to Adobe After Effects. Yeah. Is what it would be the closest thing for it. I mean, I know that you can use Blender. And you can do some very terrifyingly amazing things with Blender. But Blender is a pain to learn. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> For everyone who keeps saying that Blender is an alternative, that's true. It is an alternative, but it is not an easy alternative. But mm. I would argue if you master Blender for like video editing and stuff, well, it's not, I don't know if it's the best video editor, but if you master it for um, compositing and various other stuff, you can do some really good stuff with it. Oh, yeah. Blender's awesome. Oh, yeah. It's great. Uh, by the way, uh, as an extra side note to go with the off topical podcast, uh, one of the things that they talked about uh, recently. It was at, I think they had an event or something recently. Yeah. Uh, they want to redo the video editor completely and add like modern features and stuff. I would definitely give it a shot if they, uh, if they did that. Yeah. Right. Cause you know, Blender is one of the few open source projects that has like, you know, a building, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like an actual yeah. building with like staff in it 24 seven. Well, not 24 seven. Well, maybe, I don't know, you know, dedication that one guy or woman who always comes in every night. Yeah. When everyone else is sleeping and just keeps working. It's always <laughs> one of them. But, you know, the Blender Foundation just has so many amazing things. And and Blender 2.8 is shaping up to be really nice. That's awesome. Now, you're pretty good with Blender, aren't you? I use it. I can't model. I'm, I'm a oh. horrible artist, but I like using it for physics simulations and compositing. I don't do it for a living. I just like making them for fun. Yeah. Sometimes I put them on YouTube and sometimes I don't. I just like doing it for myself. Sometimes you've got to do things for yourself. Right. It's always fun to challenge yourself. Um, so uh, SickMind33 also asked a second question. Would Gardner drink open source beer? And he said, yes, it exists. I would drink open source beer. I would drink open source beer if it tastes nice. <laughs> yeah. I don't... <laughs> I mean, I would try it. I would do it just to say I drank open source beer. See, I don't. The, I think he knows that I don't drink a whole lot. Like it's, <clears throat> it's not. I'm not like a teetotaler or anything. But I don't. Uh, I don't drink that often. But I would definitely give open source beer a try, um, especially if it was like at Linux Fest Northwest or some other open sourcey event. That would be cool. Yeah, I mean, you know, that wouldn't be half bad. Um, I could totally see myself trying it as well. I, I like bourbon, but, you know, every now and again, you know, a good tasting beer would be fantastic. Yeah. Open source beer. Ain't that something? <laughs> I didn't even know that existed. Uh, all right. Uh, so Tannis Root from Discord. Is that right? Yep. Uh, Tannis Root asks, honest opinion of Lutris, even if negative. So I think like we said earlier when we were talking about Lutris, uh, the new release, um, you know, we're neither of us are super versed in in Lutris. Um, I really like the project. I like the people behind it, and again, they support me on Patreon. Um, but like, yeah, Lutris is pretty cool. I like the idea. I like the uh, the fact that it handles. It takes a lot of the hassle out of uh, out of wine games. You know. Oh, absolutely. Um, I really, really like Lutris. I don't use it, but I really do like it. I mean. 
it's it's nice because you know you can bring someone over and they will be like well you know i want to run this and it's like well all you have to do is install wine and then download a compiled dxvk and then you've lost them at that point you've oh, completely yeah. lost them you know the moment you say well you have to compile and then add this feature to wine staging they're like no maybe <laughs> i'll just go back to windows this yeah. sounds you compile i have to install no no that sounds scary terminal no that sounds scary right yeah so lutris is like well just grab this and let it run the scripts and you know wait and people are like oh okay yeah i can do this because you know most people don't care if their computer is compiling in the background right even if it has to do that they just they don't want to see it right the the thing is it's like all right most people who come over from windows are gonna try ubuntu right and if it's, if it's more technical than installing Ubuntu, then you can't expect anyone who's new at Linux to do it. You can't expect that. And so, like, you know, if someone's on Ubuntu, they're fresh on the Linux in the Linux world, and you say open a terminal, that's not realistic, I don't think. You, no. If you want to keep people on the platform having fun with it rather than getting like pulling their hair out in frustration, you got to, like give people the support that they need and i think lutris really does that especially because gaming is a huge portion of people's time on their pc you know and so lutris is great and i love the fact that like it takes a lot of the hassle out of uh, a, a lot of gaming and not just wine gaming but like a lot of other uh parts of uh, of gaming you know yeah i agree it's awesome legit ian gogo on twitter asks on the subject of the video editing video on Monday, would you say that an open video editing foundation is needed to fund, coordinate, and encourage open source development in the video uh, space? Would that work to make it a viable alternative to the closed source options that exist today? That's a great question. What do you think, man? Hmm. Yes and no. Um... And, and the reason I say that is because we definitely need some form of direction. Like there, like there needs to be a reason. Like, and I think starting with maybe Caden live and building off of that would probably be, you know, the best thing for it. Like, you know, for what, you know, he wants, which is to, you know, make video editing actually viable. However, I don't see it happening because no one wants to invest money in it. Unfortunately, the part of the part of the issue with um, Caden Live specifically is that, as far as I know, and I've looked a couple times over the years, they don't accept donations, and they don't have a Patreon, and so it's like it's really it's 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 interesting to um, it's interesting because I, I would donate at least fifteen dollars a month or more. I mean, I donate a lot of money to to uh caden live repeatedly every month if they actually accept the donations but as far as i know they don't and if i'm wrong about that let me know because i really would like to be wrong about that i would love to you know give over 20 30 40 dollars a month to caden live to further its development to help it along now as far as what you're saying about uh about uh a foundation you know, if somebody created a, a an open source video editing foundation, I, I don't know if that would really um, garner the support that a foundation would actually need, you know. But what if there was like an open source creative tools foundation where it's like it supports the development of, you know, our door and Caden Live and you know, um, GIMP and Krita and these other, all these other projects that, you know, are many of them are strapped for cash. And, and it would like it would allow someone like me who makes, you know, a, a, a substantial portion of his living sleep easy at night knowing he can donate to a, an open source foundation that distributes that money evenly among the projects that he uses every day. Like I use Krita. I use GIMP. I use Caden Live audacity and all these other open source programs obs all day <laughs> you know all my entire 
uh, channel is uses these things. So I think that it would be really cool if there was a uh, some kind of like nonprofit organization that accepted donations on behalf of these projects and distributed, you know, the donations. That is, uh, so I sent you a link. Um, Caden Live is made by KDE. Yeah. So if you want to support Caden Live, you just give money to KDE. Really? Okay. I'm definitely going to do that now. If you are in Germany and you do use Amazon and you have Amazon Smile support, which honestly, if you're going to use Amazon, I don't know why you wouldn't have Amazon Smile because it gives a portion of the donations to a charity. I mean, <laughs> there's really no downside to it. Right. And you get to pick the charity. Uh, you can send uh, 0.5% of your of the price um, of your eligible purchases uh, to KDE. So if you're oh. in Germany and you like KDE and you use Amazon, uh, set up Smile and use it for KDE. Cool. But yeah, if you guys have a question for the Off Topical podcast, let us know. Uh, hit us up at uh, show at offtopical.net or uh, on Twitter at the Linux Gamer. Leave a comment down below here on YouTube or... Um, yeah, just find a way to get in contact with us, and we will probably, maybe, not guaranteeing anything, answer your question. <laughs> I want to take a second here and, uh, and thank Raven, because this show would not be what it is without you, man. So I wanted to thank you. Oh, you're welcome, man. I love being here. I, I appreciate your, your insight and also the fact that you send me these, uh, a lot of these news articles you know, all day, every day. And I, you know, it, like I said, this would not be the same show without you. Oh, you know, I'll always be here, man. I love this show. I do as well. Good audience too. It, it, it stays nice and clean. Usually in the, the discussion chats, it doesn't get like into like a pissing match or anything like that. Yeah. It's, it's great. I love the audience. The, this show has become its, its own thing. And, uh, I'm really proud of it. And I'm, uh, I just thank you everyone who listens to the show regularly. Um, you guys are rad. Well, I think that's it for today, man. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's all we've got. <laughs> Sadly. I'm sure we can drone on about uh, cloud gaming, though. Oh, yeah. I'm sure we will in the future, too. <laughs> <laughs> This has been a lot of fun. I want to thank everyone who submitted questions today. Uh, and uh, if you want, you can follow me on uh, YouTube or on uh, twitch.tv slash Zondak. Uh, this has been the Off Topical Podcast. And let's do this again soon. <laughs>